so I will start. So <clears throat> this is one of the, actually, the academic highlights of the whole year for ICTP. And uh, so let me just give you an introduction. First of all, is this, this is uh, the, what's called the Salam Distinguished Lectures that we have started in, in 2012. And so maybe just uh, to remind you, the first one was uh, Professor Nimar Kani Hamid, who gave a talk called Past, Present, and Future of Fundamental Physics. The second set of lectures was given by Professor B. Bialik from uh, Princeton, entitled The Physics of Life, Searching for Theories. And the third set of lectures was uh, given by Subir Saxdev from um, Harvard also, and uh, entitled uh, Theory of Quantum Matter from Quantum Fields to Strings. And uh, usually we organize them to coincide with the birthday of Abdul Salam, which was the uh, 29th of uh, January. So this is a way to honor the founder of the institution. Uh, the set of lectures this year has, be, has been organized. Uh, it's kind of funded by the long-term collaborator of ICTP, which is the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Science. And we have the great pleasure to have one of the top mathematicians in the world, I will say, to agree to give these lectures. So, <clears throat> it's uh, Don Zaguer, and let me say some words about Don. As uh, one of the directors of the Max Planck Institute of Mathematics in Bonn, in Germany. And as uh, now, we are very honored and, and pleased to know that I mean, he's a uh, well, distinguished as, uh, staff associate at ICTP. So, he likes very much ICTP, and he's spending a good percentage of his time with us, which is a uh, wonderful news for all of us. Um, <clears throat> Don, uh, is, uh, his main research interests are in number theory, modular forms, arithmetic geometry, quantum invariance in three-dimensional topology. One of his major results uh, is a joint work with Benedict Gross, the gross Sagier formula. As the result is known, um, it relates the der derivative of the L series of an elliptic curve at S equals to 1 to the height of certain points on the curve constructed by Higner. This theorem implies cases of the famous Bridge and swinner don dyer conjecture, and it is an ingredient to Dorian Goldfield's solution of the equally famous class number uh, problem of Gauss. Uh, don Saguier has won the Cole Prize in number theory in 1987 and the von Stout Prize in 2001. Um, over the last uh, couple of years, we have been seeing Don here often, and he has been lecturing at ICTP and, uh, and uh, collaborating with our staff. He has been a great friend of ICTP in the last uh, years. And I also have learned to know many of those uh, particular properties of uh, uh, qualities of uh, Don, who are just outstanding, I have to say, is... Um, Don is uh, one of these persons who knows about everything, who knows a uh, uh, very cultured person, and so it's beyond all what I said about mathematics constructions. He knows a lot of mathematics, but a lot of uh, many other things. Uh, he speaks so many languages, I don't know, seven or so. <laughs> and, um, and then he's an uh, extremely good pianist. I, I managed to see him once we were going for dinner to take the, our piano in the Adriatico building, I was playing a beautiful Beethoven sonata, it's a perfect thing. So, so you can see that he's, uh, he's much more beyond what uh, being a famous mathematician. So, so we have uh, today uh, Don, he's going to give this uh, uh, five sets lectures so from today to Friday. Um, and uh, in general, as I say, the topic is, is on modular forms. I forgot exactly the title. It's, uh, the magic of modular forms. The magic, so. of modular. the magic of modular forms. Okay, so let's welcome John. So, thank you very much, Fernando. Anyone who has heard me play piano will know how to discount also the rest of what you were just told. So it was. Uh, it sounded good, but the reality is a little less. So. Two other remarks about the introduction. He said some of the things I wanted to say about coming here, but I'll say them anyway. And also, you gave me the opportunity to give the first lectures I'll ever have given, which will be less technical than the introduction, because I won't have any derivatives of L series related to the Bernstein and Dyer conjecture. So this will be meant for people who aren't yet in the field, and I hope will make you interested. 
So I wanted to say that I'm really delighted and honored to have been asked by the ICTP to give this uh, series of lectures named after the wonderful person who founded it. As you just heard from Professor Quevedo, I've been coming here for several years. I think the first occasion I was a co-organizer of a conference with uh, Lothar Goethe and Katrin Brigmann. Maybe it was not the first. And during those years, I've really come to love this place for its extraordinary mixture of a very, very high scientific level, but never forgetting its mission, which is to make sure that science is for everybody and not for some kind of a lucky elite. And all of this without any kind of self-importance. It's really a very wonderful place. I've been coming here often, as you just heard, since a few months ago. I've been affiliated with the Institute as a staff associate, and I hope to be connected with it for many years to come. So that's a general comment. Another preliminary comment before I start. When I was a young man, which is uh, in the previous century, uh, I, was, I have been told that I had a, sometimes spoke too fast or wrote badly on the board. Of course, now I'm old and experienced, and that never happens. But if I should slip by accident, please you know, scream and say it's too fast or we can't read it. So these lectures are meant to be informal. You can interrupt. You can certainly ask questions. I certainly hope you will at any point. And after the lecture, I've been told it's a tradition to have a separate. After the normal question session, I think there's a break, and then we come back. And if students who maybe don't dare speak up when they're older people there have questions, uh, they're free then. And I hope many will, will come. I really look forward to that if it happens. So now I want to start. It's a five. Uh, course lecture series, and uh, today is the first. It's called Classical Modular Forms and Some of Their Applications in Arithmetic. So I'll try to explain that. First, maybe two uh, crucial preliminary points. Uh, I'll be using the board only, so as I've said before, if you can't hear or see, come closer. So modular forms are a function of a variable, and some people, most people, call it, actually everybody calls it tau except that a lot of people don't, and they call it Z or Z. And I'm unfortunately in both camps, and half of my papers do one and half the other. So I'll use tau, but if I slip and say Z, you get another chance to yell and ask me to change it back. And sometimes I might do it on purpose to see if anybody's paying any kind of attention. So if that doesn't happen, I'll be very sad and start crying. OK, the second crucial point, as I said, this is meant, I hope it'll be fun for people who do know about multiple forms, but it's mostly meant as a first introduction for those who haven't or haven't seen the many ways you can use them. And I hope that getting to know modular forms will change your life. So to assist in that process, uh, long ago, not just for this lecture series, I wrote a book, or a third of a book, called The One, Two, Three of Modular Forms. So the first third is by me, and that's the one. It's modular forms of one variable, so classical modular forms, as today. Part two is by Jan Grunier. It's about Hilbert modular forms of two variables, much more advanced. And part three by Van de Geer is about Siegel modular forms, which have three complex variables. But uh, the, the whole book is very nice, but the first chapter uh, is meant to be very elementary. And I hope you'll, everybody will buy at least one copy, keep it under your pillow, and give it to all of your friends when you visit them for dinner. It's much better than wine. OK. so. That's just preliminary comments. So just a few words first what multiple forms are. You'll be hearing a lot about them. In the abstract, I wrote, and I have to read it, multiple forms are functions having an infinite group of symmetries and many beautiful properties. So I hope to convince you that the second assertion is an understatement. It's really extraordinarily beautiful properties, and many, many. Uh, the famous number theorist and algebraist Martin Eichler, whom I got to know very well because we together developed a theory of so-called Jacobi forms and wrote a book about it. And it's, there's an apocryphal quote, I don't know if he really said it, by him that there are five basic operations in mathematics. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and modular forms. So I don't know if he really said it, but they're certainly very beautiful. And they have many, many... Up, uh, appearances in the rest of mathematics and mathematical physics, not only in the past, but in recent years, actually more and more. It's increasing. 
And I've chosen five of those themes for the five lectures of this series, and I chose five that are close to my heart because I've worked on all of them, but of course there would, would have been many more. So, before I write down any technical definition, I should say that the definition of a modular form, there are really two ways of looking at them. And it's exactly because the two ways are not quite obviously the same. That in fact, it's not obvious at all that you're talking about the same thing until you start doing it. And it's exactly because of that that the theory is so fertile. So a modular form, as I already said, will be a function of one complex variable called tau, unless I forget and call it z. And it will have, as I said in the abstract, an infinite group of symmetries. That means that there's an infinite group which sends tau to other values of tau. And the function f is either invariant under those transformations or transforms in a very, very simple way. So one point of view is f of tau with an infinite group of symmetries. In other words, as I said, there are infinitely many transformations. Well, it's finitely generated, so you only need a finite number to understand it, uh, where you send tau to some tau prime, and f of tau is either equal to f of tau prime or differs from it by a simple uh, scaling factor. So that's from one point of view. And that's why they're very deep objects, because there's this hidden infinite group of, actually non-abelian infinite group of symmetries. But from the other point of view, f will be a power series, just a power series, but not in the same variable, in a new variable. And that's the one thing you have to remember. Q will always be, I'll mention it many times, but it will always be e to the 2 pi i tau. I'll come back to it when I need it. And so you can also think of this function as a power series in a completely different variable. And as a power series, it's, the reason it's interesting is because a n is often, and you'll see many, many examples already in today's lecture, an interesting or very interesting arithmetical function. So these, so typically functions that number theorists want to study, and you'll see many examples, appear sometimes fairly obviously and sometimes very, very mysteriously as the coefficients of the expansion of this other variable, q, of a modular form. So here you see the infinite symmetries. Here you don't see any symmetries, but you see interesting coefficients. And now the word magic in my title, this is multiple forms, which I'll usually abbreviate for laziness, MFs. But the magic part is that from the second point of view, it's, you get easy proofs, automatic proofs, so computer programmable proofs, of identities. And again, you'll see many, many examples among these coefficients. So again, these coefficients, a, n, will typically be something very interesting. But I might, for instance, have a second model to form g equals some b, n, q to the n, and have guessed that a, n, and b, n are the same, because the first 20 values agree. And a, n comes from, you know, not theory or from somewhere, and Bn comes from some other part of mathematics or physics, and I see no way to prove it. But if I know that both of them are multiple forms, there's a, a principle that tells you that it's automatic to check that if a few terms are equal, they're all equal. So it's uh, easy, I could even say trivial or free proofs. There's no work involved at all once you know that things are multiple forms. And that you only get from the second point of view. So that's somehow the mechanism why multiple forms are set up to both be deep, because they have this infinite non-abelian symmetry group, and to be useful, because they have expansions whose coefficients are numbers that we care about, and at the same time, that it's very, very easy to study from the point of view of identities. So I'm going to give you many, uh, many examples, and then you'll see how these principles work. Uh, it'll all come. This is a non-technical introduction, but it's, it's either one. So sometimes n is from 0 to infinity, sometimes it starts at a negative integer. It's, it's both. I didn't want to be that precise. This is just saying the two points of view. No, later. This is with two introductory sentences. This is, I'm going to be lecturing for 10 hours. Uh, there'll be plenty. This is just to say that there are two points of view. And it has nothing to do with proof theory. I'll come to it later, please. I'll come to it later when I get to that part. This was just a brief survey of like an introductory two remarks, what I'm going to do. So the lectures now start. And so there are these two points of view, one and two. And so I start with point of view one. By the way, can everybody see the board? 
I hope that no part is cut off. But if, for instance, there, I'll try to use the central part, but when I start having to erase, I may have to move a little. So I start with the variable tau. Well, I've been telling you that it's a complex variable, and indeed it is, but it's only in the, that's meant to be a German, like that. H is the upper half plane, so in the complex plane, if you have zero here and I somewhere here, uh, it, well, zero wouldn't be in it, then it's all points which are which have strictly imaginary part. So these are the tau that have strictly imaginary part. And it's very well known that the, uh, the group of, I don't have to give it a name, SL2R of two by two matrices. So these are two by two matrices with determinate one, AD minus BC equals one with real coefficients. This thing acts on the upper half plane. Uh, so I'll have G tau is A tau plus B over C tau plus D. And then that's a group action if you do it twice with G1 and G2. It's the same as you've did it once with G1 times G2. So you get a group action. And the reason this is interesting, well, what we're interested in is a subgroup. And I'm going to fix, for simplicity, I'll fix the notation that in SL2R, I take SL2Z, which is the same thing, but now it's matrices, which I'll also often call gamma to emphasize that they're in the discrete group, A, B, C, D are now integers. So this group, of course, also acts. And I'm interested in functions, essentially in functions which are invariant under this action. So that means that I'm interested in dividing by this group action. So I'll write H modulo gamma. It should maybe be on the left for the quotient. So these are the equivalence classes of gamma. And I'm sure many of you have seen, but I won't use it, a picture of this famous fundamental domain. If you take here the point i and here a sixth root of unity, the other corner is a cube root of unity, minus 1 plus i squared of 3 over 2, and these vertical lines, then every point in the upper half plane is equivalent under gamma to a unique point of this domain, except that points on the boundary, these two points get identified with each other, and here opposite points get identified. So the picture of H modulo gamma would look like this. It's got one cusp. It goes off to infinity. It gets thinner and thinner in the so-called hyperbolic metric. And it has two little small singularities where the total angle is not 360 degrees, but 180 or 120, which are those two bad points. But you don't need that picture for anything. But what is important is that the quotient, H modulo gamma, is what some has called M1, the moduli space. M1 one would be more correct. The moduli space of elliptic curves. And so that's going to lead to the definition of modular forms, and so I want to explain it. So we have two levels of functions. A modular function, this is already a definition now, a modular function is simply a function, a holomorphic function for us, holomorphic function f, which goes from h to c, but it's invariant under gamma. So it actually goes from h modulo gamma to c. So f of a tau plus b over c tau plus d equals f of tau. Now, because of this identification, you can think of this as f, such an f, is the same as a function on the space of all elliptic curves. So I want to remind you very briefly what an elliptic curve is. I'm working over the complex numbers. E is an elliptic curve. That means it's a, it's a curve, but over C. So it's actually a surface. It's a Riemann surface. Plus, it has a group action. And then it's very easy to know that you know, all, all surfaces have a genus, the number of handles. And if the genus is 1, it's a torus. And it's very easy to check that anything that has a group action uh, has to be a torus. So topologically, it looks like a torus. And there's a marked point, because it's a group, so there's an origin. And then you can show very easily from that that the E is actually the quotient of C modulo L. So L is some lattice for which I can choose a basis, say omega 1 and omega 2. So here's the complex plane, and here's omega 1, and here's omega 2. So omega 1, omega 2, omega 1 plus omega 2. And then you have the whole lattice of you know, all linear combinations. And when I divide by that, well, I just identify this side by this side, 
and this side by this side, like in kind of Pac-Man or the modern equivalents, where the little man, when he wanders off the right edge of the screen, comes in at the left edge of the screen. So you get C modulo L, OK? So therefore, I can also say, uh, if L is the set of all lattices, so a lattice is just such a discrete subgroup in C, then my F I can identify with a function from L to C, but there's a slight subtlety. If you multiply the whole lattice by a constant, a complex constant, so you scale it and maybe rotate it, uh, then if you take C modulo L, C times L, or just L, then those are isomorphic curves. That's very easy to see. You simply send z to c times z. And that gives an isomorphism. So if I want isomorphism classes, which is what I do, this is the multi space of isomorphism classes, then I should have the property that f of c times a lattice is equal to f of l. So in other words, it's actually a function on l modulo c star. So that's what a modular function is. But that turns out to be too restrictive. And the title of my lecture series is not the magic of modular functions, but of modular forms. That's a slightly bigger class, which I want to ex explain here. So from the, this point of view of lattices, a modular form, modular forms, is more general, a modular form of weight. So a modular form will have a weight, which typically will be an integer, uh, and sometimes a half integer. You'll see examples of both already today. So there's a certain number called the weight, and if the weight is zero, then that's exactly the case I just told you. That's what's called a modular function. OK, so if I think that from this point of view of a function on lattices, then I again look at functions on lattices, but now they don't satisfy that they're invariant when you rescale the lattice, but they're homogeneous of some degree, which I call minus k. The minus sign is more convenient because the examples then all get positive weight. OK? So this is my basic definition, but that's a little awkward to work with. And so the first trivial remark to make is the following. If I have any lattice at all, and I call it z omega 1 plus z omega 2, remember I'm allowed to rescale it. So if I just multiply by omega 2 inverse, then it will have a special form, the new basis, the second element, will be 1, and the first one I'll call tau. So tau is equal to omega 1 divided by omega 2. And if I always choose omega 1 to be to the left of omega 2 in the order, I mean, one of them is to the left of the other, then tau will be in the upper half plane. So in this way, I, that's why I only have to look at tau. But now watch what happens when you change omega 1, omega 2, to omega 1 prime, omega 2 prime, where I make a linear change of variables, a omega 1 plus b omega 2, c omega 1 plus d omega 2. Well, here a, b, c, d are again integers with determinant 1. And so that means I've just ch changed my basis over z. So it's the same lattice. So f has to be the same function. F of, it's the same lattice. I mean, I don't even have to write it. There's, it's an empty statement. f of l is f of l. But now if I divide through, then I see that the tau will now go to tau prime, which is omega 2 prime over uh, omega 1 prime over omega 2 prime. And so it's a omega 1 plus b omega 2 divided by c omega 1 plus d omega 2. And if I take out a tau everywhere, I see that I get exactly the formula I had before. That's why I told you that H modulo gamma with this action of gamma classifies elliptic curves. But now if I take this equation, then I see that I can translate between f and f, which is f, capital F was my functional lattices, little f is a function on the upper half plane, and the translation is f of, once I have f, then I define little f just by considering capital F on the special lattice generated by tau and one. But conversely, if I have little f, then I can get f on any lattice at all with any basis by using the scaling property to say it's omega two to the minus k, times little f of omega 1 over omega 2. So in this way, I have a passage, and I can translate this very confusing thing of functional lattices to just a function of a complex variable. But when I do that, then because of this uh, 
scaling factor, omega 2 to the minus k. It's a one-line exercise, which you should do, maybe not while I'm talking, but tonight when you're falling asleep, if you've never seen it. But then this definition transforms into the actual definition that I want to use, uh, a function, a holomorphic function, f from h to c is a modular form of wave k, say an integer for the moment, it'll have to be an integer, if, an even an even integer if my group is all of SL2c, if it transforms not the way it did for a modular function, which was simply invariant, so before we adjust f of tau, but now there will be this famous transformation factor called the automorphy factor, c tau plus d to the k. So this is just a translation of this. So now if at least you find it, it's still a bit abstract, but starting from now there will be examples and you'll see how it works. And actually, you can forget all of this because as I've already said, the second point of view with explicit expansions is the one we'll use and that's completely elementary. But if I didn't tell this point of view, you wouldn't have any idea why the other thing works. So I didn't want to skip it, but it'll be mostly the other point of view that I use. But now I can already give examples still following this point of view. So examples, well these are called the Eisenstein series. So it's defined on lattices. Let's see, GK of a lattice is very simple. I simply take all elements of the lattice, uh, which are not the zero element, and I, su I sum up one over omega to the K. So here, k should be bigger than 2 in order for, uh, for absolute convergence. You can do something for k equals 2, but I'll skip it. It's more technical. So this is a good function. If k is bigger than 2, you check easily that it's absolutely convergent, and therefore the sum makes sense. It doesn't matter in which order I add up these numbers um, to the minus k, I get the same thing. And of course, this key property is obvious. If I scale the whole lattice by 3, I multiply every omega by 3, and so I multiply this thing by 3 to the minus k. So that's completely OK. And then this corresponds to a function that I'll just write with gk of tau, which is therefore the sum, uh, essentially, 1 over m tau plus n to the k. There may be a half, depending how you know. If I do it this way, it's like that. Again, m and n different from 0. I'll just put a prime, meaning you don't, you don't take 0 to the minus k. You take everything else. So this is a function, and then because of what I told you, since this scales the right way, this automatically scales the right way, and so do I have to write it? Maybe I do, multiple forms of weight k, notation. Uh, mk is the vector space of multiple forms of weight k, it's finite dimensional, and, and gk is an element of it. However, it's clear that if k is odd, then omega and minus omega cancel, so we actually only get this or uh, 4, 6, 8, and so on. And now I want to show you that G4 and G6 are somehow more important than the others. In fact, there's a theorem, very easy theorem, but very important, that the ring, which is usually called M star, which is just the sum of all of these MKs, so you allow all multiple forms of all weights. I didn't say something, I lied a little bit, but you'll, I'll, I'll correct it in a minute. This ring is simply freely generated by G4 and G6. So every modular form, as it happens, is a polynomial in these two special ones. And so although I've only given you two examples, you actually at the moment have all examples, at least for gamma is SL2Z. I want to mention now already that you also look at modular forms in other groups, also higher dimensional, but in particular in one variable tau, that gamma might be replaced by a subgroup of finite index. And many of my exams look like that. And then there are many more multiple forms. So don't believe that if you've seen G4 and G6, you know everything. But that's the sort of crucial thing. Now, yes? Sorry? Uh, no, I don't need it because here, in particular, M0 is, is I certainly want, I want a ring with identity. So I don't want to start it. M01 is an excellent multiple form. But M2 is simply the zero space, and so are all the old ones. There is no G2, but there's still a space. It's just the zero vector space. So G2 is not a modular form. It's what's called quasi-modular, and I'll talk about it in a later lecture, but it's not actually in there. 
So M2 is zero, and the first M4 is G4. I'll, I'll give you more examples of this in one minute, but I wanted to explain still the last thing, the connection with elliptic curves, uh, why G4 and G6 play a special role. And this is something that I think even among the diploma students, most people will have seen, and certainly the more advanced uh, so, stations, so. which is the Weierstrass equation. Yeah. A modular form is defined by A, B, C, D, right? Yeah, I didn't understand. A modular form is defined by A, B, C, D, no? No. Not at all. The modular form is written. A modular form is a function. It's, there's no A, B, C, D in the definition. It satisfies this for every, for all A, B, C, and D, which are integers, uh, with A, D minus B, C is one, but, but they vary. That's not part of the definition. There's no A, B, C, D in the definition. It's a single function. Well, K is a property of the modular form. So you have modular forms of weight four, of weight six, uh, but it can also not vary. There are many modular forms of weight 100. It's not a unique property. It's like the height of a person. You could have two people who are six feet high. This is just called, uh, you know, it happens to have the weight, which is an invariant, is this number K. So there are many, many multiple forms of a given weight, but a multiple form has a weight, just like a human being has a height. Well, they're different. It's like two people with the same height. I mean, they're just different. They're different functions. They simply, you know, I mean, one of them satisfies F1. Uh, let me take an example. Here's an element of, the, of SL2Z, because those are integers. The determinant is one. So I have one function, for instance, weight 12, and I'll give examples in a moment which satisfies this. And I have a second function with the same equation. Well, they're completely different functions. It's just a symmetry. It's like you have many even. Let's say I take the word even in, in high school mathematics. You have f of x is f of minus x. So it's always called even, but there are many such functions like x squared and cosine x. I mean, it's just a property. It doesn't, it doesn't fix the function. I mean, I've, in fact, I've given this formula here. So you see that there are many, many multiple forms of weight k. But anyway, you'll be seeing examples. I think everything will be clear, I hope, very soon as I go on, then you see more examples, and then you see how it works. Because, of course, I'm going through the definitions quickly. I don't know. There is no form of weight 2. It's 0. No, I'm coming to the virus trust function. Now, nothing, it has something to do. I'm going to explain now. Not at all. The virus trust function is a function of a different variable. It's not even a function of the same variable. It's completely different. I'll come to it now. I'm about to explain it. So that's a very good question. The question was the connection with the virus trust function. So I'll say it right away. There's a theorem uh, due, I mean, there's many parts, so to speak. It was many years of research, the virus trust theorem. And it says, let E be an elliptic curve over the complex numbers. So remember, I already told you that means that it's a curve, which means it's actually a Riemann surface. And it has a group structure, which means automatically that topologically it has to be a torus. No other genus except genus 1 is permitted for a group. And it has an origin. And it, in fact, looks like, see, we already said, I, and that's easy, that it is this form. But Weierstrass proved uh, two wonderful things. So he proved, first of all, E has a model. The model, you know, this is only up to isomorphism. It's just an abstract Riemann surface of a complex variety. So you might choose different equations for it, and each such equation is called the model. And this is the famous Weierstrass form. Here, A and B are constants in C, and there's a restriction, which is, you can forget, which says that the cubic on the right does not have repeated roots. But if you take generic A and B, take two cons, like 3 and 11, so that would be typically an elliptic curve. And the claim is that you can always, so here x and y vary. And if you think of this here, if I draw the real picture, but of course it's really complex, this cubic might have three roots. And then the, the curve will look like this. So I just take, so this would be E. In this case, it would have two real components. But of the complex numbers, it's a torus. So it's a theorem of Weierstrass that you can always find a model which is that a cubic in x, and you can normalize the, const the quadratic term is 0, equals the square of another variable. So in other words, this is the graph. If I do it, this is simply the graph 
in, in the usual sense of xy coordinates of the function y is the square root of x cubed plus ax plus b. So that's a theorem. But the second part of the theorem is if e is what I already said, I've already given you an example which the lattice which I could normalize one of the generators to be one, so it's z tau plus z, then up to stupid constants, I'll just put a star as people do in mathematics for boring constants, this constant is the function g, it now it becomes a function of tau because tau can vary. These two constants, which are the crucial constants to define the elliptic curve, are exactly the two Eisenstein series. I've introduced there's some stupid factor in front, like you know, 140 pi to the sixth or something. I don't care. So in other words, these g4 and g6, which are molded forms, are very special because they define this. And now to ask the question about the Weierstrass function, I don't want to go into this at, at all in detail. But if you have a function, then Weierstrass de defined a function. If you have a, an elliptic curve, c over l, he defined a function which depends, of course, on that lattice, p of z, and it's approximately the sum over omega in the lattice of 1 over z plus omega squared. It doesn't quite converge. There's a little trick to make it converge. I don't want to talk about it because I'll never come back to this. And now, what he shows is that the actual parameterization, this, but this function is invariant under the lattice. Uh, obviously, from this, because I'm just taking all shifts. And therefore, it's actually a function from c modulo l. Uh, and so now I can go into c times c, so x and y capital X and capital Y, in the following way, I set z equal to the Weierstrass p function, uh, sorry, x, and I set y equal to half the derivative of the Weierstrass p function. And then if you do that, Weierstrass showed that those two functions identically satisfied this equation, and that's how he got part two from part one. Again, if you happen to have seen elliptic curves, this may be useful. If you haven't, it's for the next time that you see them, it will ring a bell. I'll never talk about it again, and I would not like to answer questions about this because it's, it's not my subject. It's just a side remark for those who know the Weierstrass function. This is the connection that in the famous uh, equation, p prime squared is p cubed plus you know, 4p cubed plus g2p plus g3, this is the g2 and g3. So if you know elliptic curves, this is meant to be enlightening, but I don't want to talk about elliptic curves and that will never come back. So now I want to get to the main point, which is point of view two. Uh, the point of view two, as I told you, is that we have a Fourier expansion, or a Q expansion. So I now come to that. And now everything should become much more explicit and much more elementary. The hard part is gone, and I'll never use that again. From now on, it will be just numbers. So the second point of view, I had a one in, in a circle, which was the first point of view with the infinite group of symmetries. Now the second point of view, as already mentioned, or maybe I didn't mention, the group SL2Z certainly contains the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1. And so if you look at this famous transformation, a tau plus b over c tau plus d, in this case, it's just that. And the automorphy factor, the, the c tau plus d, is just 1, so I don't need it. So what I get is that this is true not only for modular functions, but for all modular forms. Capital MF is always modular form for me, not modular function. So every modular form is translation invariant. That means that if I look at it in the upper half plane, forget the fundamental domain I drew before, but just make strips from 0, 1, 2, then whatever the function does here, it simply repeats uh, with period 1, just like cosine or sine. It's a periodic function. But then just as we know very well from Euler that the fact that cosine of 2 pi x uh, has period uh, 1 means that this can be written as a combination of e to the 2 pi i x and e to the minus 2 pi i x, so in the same way, any function, any holomorphic function of tau, which is translation invariant, can be expanded, and of course the, tr the converse is trivially true by Euler's theorem, e to the 2 pi i equals 1, Euler's formula. This means that f is a function of q, where I already wrote q, but I'll write it again, q is e to the 2 pi i tau. So because of Euler's formula, e to the 2 pi equals 1, if I change tau by 1, q doesn't change. So if I have a function of q, then of course it's invariant. But conversely, it's very well known that if I have a function uh, of tau, which is invariant, it's a function of q. And a priori n is an integer, 
But I only want that answers the earlier question about Laurent series. I didn't say it before because it was more awkward in that language. But I only want to allow functions with positive coefficients or uh, positive exponents or zero, but not negative. Sometimes one looks at the others, but I won't need them. OK, so that's, well, for modular functions, you do need them. But for modular forms, you don't. So a holomorphic modular form will look like this. Maybe that looks abstract for the moment. I just used you know, a big theorem of Fourier. But actually, now everything is extremely easy. So now I start with examples of modular forms, but now in this language, which is much, much easier. So the first example is the same example we already had, Eisenstein series, but now in the new world. So I'm going to define an infinite series of explicit functions and to avoid confusion with the G, I'll call them E. So E4 of tau, I still call it a function of tau, but I write it in terms of Q. And Q remembers E to the 2 pi i tau. So, well, first I'll write it the, in the shortest formula that I can. No, I'll write it out. So the, well, to make it exactly like I did before, I want a Fourier expansion. The a n here will be, a zero will be one, and the other coefficients will always be divisible by 240 in this strange example. And the coefficient of q to the n for n positive is 240 times sigma three of n. So sigma three of n is the sum over all positive divisors of n, let's say m, divides m of m cubed. And you can imagine that sigma five of n is the sum of m to the fifth. So this is my first example of what I said in the introduction. This is an arithmetically interesting function. For instance, it's got multiplicative properties. As an example, if I take a prime, then I get this. But if I don't have a prime, it'll be bigger. So this is true if and only if n is prime. So you can use it as a test for primality if you want. I mean, it's already in a function that number theorists care about. It's not one of the most important, but it's already a nice example. Now, uh, so explicitly, if I write out the first few of these, I'll just take two because I don't remember more. But of course, your computer will give you a 1,000 in, in a split second. It's that. And similarly, I take E6 of tau, which is 1 minus 504. Don't worry where these constants uh, now put the sum in the usual place. Don't worry where the constant 240 and minus 504 come from. It's some easy formula for each k there's a constant. And for each k, there's always such a constant. And uh, so I'll do one more. I have a reason. So the next one is plus 480, and then it'll be the sum, of course, n positive, sigma 7 of n, q to the n. So each ek will be a multiple, and then sigma k minus 1. So this will start q, and the next one I actually don't remember, but I have it written down, 61920. Yeah? Uh, it's coming in th four seconds. I just wanted to write down what they are. So there exist multiple forms. And what I claim here, I've just given an, complete, an explicit formula. You cannot see anything from this formula. You can see that it would be nice to understand this function, because this is an interesting function. But you don't understand, why did I make this definition? Why plus 240? Why anything? But the fact is that, in fact, each ek is some constant which is completely explicitly known times gk. In other words, if you start with the gk, which I did define in a sensible way by taking the sum 1 over m tau plus n to the k, that is obviously modular. It had the modular property. But you can't see that it has interesting coefficients. But it's an elementary cal calculation given in every book, of course, also this one. You compute the Fourier expansion, and you find that up to some boring constant, this is a multiple of this ek. So therefore, this is a modular form. And this is a modular form. And this is a modular form. But now, for the first time, you can see the magic. And so, you know, I hope that you, if you haven't seen this before, you'll, you'll like it. It's the very, very most trivial example, but it already shows you how powerful the theory is. Namely, if you have very good eyes, I mean mathematical eyes, not to ocular eyes, then you might have looked at this power series with the coefficients 1, 486, 1, 9, 2, 0, and said, wait, that's funny. That power series begins exactly like the square of this power series. Did anyone notice that? 
So if you square this, you get 1, 480, 2 times 240, and then 240 squared plus twice 2160, believe me, is that. So you might guess that E8 is E4 squared. Right, that would be a reasonable guess because the first three coefficients work. Then you ask your computer and the first 10,000 coefficients work. That wouldn't normally be a proof in mathematics. But here it is a proof. The proof is now automatic. Simply because, well, I actually already told you that every modular form is a polynomial in E4 and E6, and this is weight 8. The only possibility is E4 squared. But let me give you the full property. So let dk be the dimension of mk, which is a known number, roughly k over 12. So the dimension grows roughly linearly like k over 12, but it's an exact formula. So we know the dimension. OK? And then we have the magic principle. I can give it even in two forms. One, if f and g are two modular forms of the same weight k, we're, we're, the question is, again, you've guessed an identity that two modular forms are equal, like E4 squared and E8. But they better have the same weight. Because if they have different weights, they will never be equal, and you were just wrong with your guess. So let's assume right from the start that they're of the same weight. And if the first dk Fourier coefficients, so you write f as some a n q to the n, g as some b n q to the n, and then you look at a n, I want the first so many Fourier coefficients should agree. So in other words, I have an equals bn for n equals 0 up to dk minus 1. Then f equals g. So in our case, the dimension is 1. You just have to look at one single coefficient. Once this 1 agrees, then all the rest are automatic. And indeed, the first three you can see pretty much in your head. And the other version, I won't insist, but it's the same if f and g are in mk, and if f of tau i equals g of tau i for, again, dk, distinct points uh, of h, well, in the fundamental domain that says that this is modulo gamma, then, again, they're equal. So to identify a form, you don't need to know an infinite amount of data. You need only a usually very small number of initial Fourier coefficients or a small number of values. And that's what I meant before about a computer proof, but you don't, it's not a computer proof in the sense, I don't mean that the computer finds the proof. You simply need a computer because most people can't multiply numbers to 100 digits in their head, but it's simply, a, it's a trivial numerical verification. So it's like checking when two polynomials are the same. If you give me two polynomials of degree 20, and you think they're the same, but they're written differently, each one is a polynomial and other polynomials, but I know, I can see that their degrees at most 20. Then I can simply check by hand or by computer, by, I calculate, that 20 values of these polynomials, or 21, agree. And then they're equal. And the point is that modular forms are just as precise, just as rigid as polynomials. And so you have this magic principle that if you just look at the beginning of an identity, then you get the whole identity for free. So now I've gone very, uh, I, you know, I hope in quite a lot of detail on this introductory part. And now I want to give you a series of uh, applications to number theory. I have eight here. I hope I'll get through them all. And each one I'll say just fairly briefly how it follows. So I'll stop talking about modular forms. I'll now tell you eight beautiful theorems of number theory. And each one comes from multiple forms. And I'll try to say very briefly how it does in each case. But I may or may not succeed. So I'll make a slight pause to erase the board. And that gives you time to breathe, in case I have started talking fast after all. OK, so now comes the promised applications to number theory. OK? So the first one is a rather boring one. It's not a very interesting theorem, but I'm putting it down because it shows exactly how the thing works. So the theorem is for all n, your natural numbers, positive integers. Sigma 7 of m remembers the sum of divisors of n to the power 7. And the claim is that's the same as sigma 3 of n, the sum of the divisors uh, to the weight 3, plus 120 times the sum l from 1 to n minus 1 of sigma 3 of l, the sum of the cubes of the divisors, 
times sigma 3 of n minus L. It's kind of a stupid formula, but still it means you can get sigma 7 out of sigma 3. So an example of the example, if I take n equals 2, you'd have the devices of 2 are 2 and 1. So 2 to the 7 plus 1 to the 7 should be 3 to the 7 plus 1 to the 7 plus 120 times 1 to the 7 times 1 to the 7. Then you can see this is 128 plus 1 is, uh, sorry, uh, I must have fallen asleep. The 3 was here. Uh, and this is also 3, not that it matters in the case of 1. And so this is 8 plus 1 plus 120. And I think everybody can check that that's true. But it's true for every n. And the proof is, so I can give you the entire proof. And it takes, you know, less than a line. It takes a one, one centimeter. And the proof is also one centimeter. Uh, I'll just add the word trivially. This is true simply because they're both modular forms and one coefficient degrees, and you're finished. So you don't have to do any work. There are elementary proofs of this. One of my friends, actually, a doctoral thesis of mine, wrote his master's thesis on that, but it's a 20-page proof. So to prove this directly can be done, but it's very hard. But now, you, 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 know, you need nothing. It just falls into your lap. So that's a kind of a stupid example, because nobody really cares about writing sums of seventh powers of device in terms of sums of cubes of divisors. But now comes a theorem which is historically, actually it's, it's several theorems. I'll write a corollary which is already a famous theorem. So again, for n, a natural number, define R2 of n to be the number of representations. This is a famous question of number theory going back to Diophantus in the second century and to Fermat in the 17th century. It's the number of representations of n as a sum of two squares. So a and b are z in z. You have to be a little careful when you count. Like for five, you might think naively, there's only one way to write five as a sum of two squares. It's four plus one. But actually, there are eight ways. Because first of all, it's also one plus four. I mean, a and b are, are labeled. And secondly, I'm not telling you a squared. I'm telling you a and b. So a could be plus or minus two squared. And b could be plus or minus 1 squared and the same here. So this is 8, 4, that's 4. They're actually 8. So for instance, r2 of 5 should be 8. So we'll see in a minute if that comes out. And similarly, I define r4 of n, equally a famous question of number theory, as the number of representations of n as a sum of 4 squares. Then. I have explicit formulas, and these are absolutely wonderful number theoretical formulas, completely elementary. You can show to a good high school student just this formula, in particular for R4. R4 is always divisible by 4, and it's the sum over all the divisors of n, which are odd. So for instance, 1 is always an odd divisor. And then you take minus 1 to the power d minus 1 over 2. And that gives you the example. So let's do it for 5. 5 is two divisors, 1 and 5. 1 minus 1 over 2 is 0. 5 minus 1 over 2 is 2. They're both even, so I get plus 1 plus 1 is 2, and the 4, and I get the 8 that we already had. And the other form is no more complicated. In fact, it's slightly easier. R4 of n is the sum d divides n. This time, instead of not being divisible by 2, it's not divisible by 4. And now it's simply the sum of d. That's an absolutely wonderful theorem, and the, I mean, that gives closed formulas for these rather deep numbers, the number of ways of writing, say, a large number. So as an example, if I have a, a prime, so if, if n is a prime, then r4 of p, well, the divisors are 1 and uh, an odd prime. Of course, they're 1 and p, and so you'll get, sorry, there's an 8 that I forgot. You'll always, always get 8p plus 8. So that's completely amazing that the number of ways to write an odd prime, say 131, as a sum of 4 squared is exactly 8p plus 8 for every prime p. So that follows. And, and a corollary of this, of course, you'll notice that among the, odd, among the device of n is always 1, which is not divisible by 4. So this at least 8. So it's positive. So r4 of n is positive. So every n is a sum of 4 squares. That's one of the most famous theorems of elementary number theory. Extremely tricky to prove if you've never seen it. That was Lagrange's theorem in the 18th century, but the proof is very hard. Whereas here, this proof of a much stronger theorem, not just that it's positive, but that it's exactly this, is actually very easy. And so let me show you in two lines how you prove it. Of course, uh, one has to prove things uh, to, to get the whole proof. But let me just tell you the mechanism. We take theta of tau 
which is the sum over all integers of q to the n squared. So that means 1 plus q plus q to the fourth plus q to the ninth and so on, all squares, except that it isn't because, as I just said, when you have, right, four is a square, it's both two squared and minus two squared. So you have to count everything twice except for the one. Then it's a fact that this, but that's very classical, it was proved by Jacobi in 1840 or something, that theta is a multiple form in the sense that I haven't quite defined of way to half uh, on some subgroup of, of index something in, in SL2Z. So therefore, theta squared and theta fourth are some kind of multiple forms, not for R gamma, but for some other gamma of index, in this case six, in this case 12, in the original gamma, in SL2Z. Okay? But if you think about it a second, then you'll see immediately that the Fourier expands of these, just from the definition, are these numbers. That's what I meant when I said that the coefficients of multiple forms could be interesting, arithmetically interesting multiple, uh, arithmetic functions. Here, the nth coefficient is the number of ways of writing n as a sum of four squares, one of the very, very classical questions of elementary number theory. And so, in fact, they're both Eisenstein series. So the Eisenstein series I defined above is just for the full group SL2Z, but you can also take subgroups, and then it changes the form just slightly. But remember that for the Eisenstein series EK, we had the sum of the divisors of m to the power k minus 1. So if the weight is either 1 or 2, you'll either have no power or the first power. And you see here this is d to the 0 and d to the 1, but there's some congruence conditions about d mod 4. So you know, roughly this is uh, how it goes. So, but believe me, this is very easy to prove, and then you get a proof in, in three lines after a little preliminary on multiple forms of this rather deep theorem of number theory. Again, I won't go on because I have many more examples. Yeah? No. Uh, it's a very good question. It's very hard. The problem is, if I take theta to the sixth, you can even do odd powers, it's yet harder. If I take theta to the sixth, it's certainly a multiple form. And theta to the tenth, every even power. But it's not always an Eisenstein series. Remember, the principle only said if f and g are two multiple forms of the same weight, and if numerically you see that they begin the same way, you can prove it. But if they're different, you know, that happens. And so if I want to prove that theta squared is some, it's some Eisenstein series of weight one, but with a prime in some other group, and theta to the fourth is some other Eisenstein series, I have to guess the Eisenstein series Look at the first few coefficients, and then I can prove it instantly by the magical principle. But if I take theta to the hundredth, this will be the corresponding Eisenstein series of weight 50 plus lots of other terms called cusp forms, and they're simply present, so they mess up the formula. So it's simply, the method works, but the result is simply not true. But again, you don't have to do any thinking. The, the calculation just tells you when you have identities like that and when you don't. There's a very natural question. There are hundreds of papers studying the higher cases by studying those cusp forms and trying to make sense of the formulas, but these are the only really easy ones. Okay, so I want to continue with my examples. So example three is absolutely crucial. It's not as beautiful in the sense that I'm going to show you a function that if you haven't seen modular forms, you haven't seen before, and so you'll say, why should I care? But I'll show you the property that should make you care. So let's define delta of tau to be, again, in terms of q, it's given by an infinite product, one minus q to the n to the power 24. So it looks very strange, but it's, that's what it is, okay? So this is the so-called discriminant function, a Ramanujan function. It has a Q expansion, which starts with coefficients 1, minus 24, 252. And then if you go on a little, you find that the coefficient of Q to the sixth is minus 6,048. And Ramanujan, so we, we call these coefficients tau of n, not the same tau, Q to the n. So Ramanujan, well, I should write him out. He's a pretty important guy. Uh, in 1916, observed, uh, you know, he just looked at these numbers and he said, wait a second, minus 6,048 is not a random number. It's the product of minus 24 and of Q and of 252. In other words, the product tau of 2 times tau of 3 is tau of 6. And so then he guessed and he checked by hand. Well, obviously, there were no computers. He checked that more generally, you have what's called multiplicativity, which means whenever m and n are co-prime integers, then these coefficients multiply. Now, that was one of the shortest-lived conjectures. Later, I'll talk about a conjecture that took a 1,000 years to prove. But this one was proved by, so this was conjecture and theorem, same 
result proved by Mordell one year later. So this is really true, not just up to 30, Brahman, John checked it up to 30, but it's really true. Now, that's a wonderful, wonderful property. Even if you haven't seen this, you must see that something amazing is going on. Why should this be the product of these? It looks completely wild. And so I want to say a few words about that, because although it's a little less, I mean, I can't go into it, because it would take us way too far afield, but it's the most important part of the whole theory. So I'll just say that Hecke, in the period between the world wars, developed a theory, and in particular, the main theorem is all multiple forms, not just for gamma, but for any gamma star, has a basis. It's uniquely spanned of, I'll call them Hecke forms, which means exactly this property, that if you write the Fourier expansion a n q to the n, then a m a n is equal to a m n whenever m and n are co-prime. So we'll call such a thing a Hecke form, and the point is they're not rare. This behavior of delta is not some kind of a fluke. To the contrary, uh, everything is. So let me give you an easy example. So examples, of course, delta, but also if I take 1 over 240 times e4. Well, the constant term is 1 over 240, but that doesn't play any role here. And the other terms, remember, were sigma 3 of n, the sum of the cubes of the divisors. And it's very easy to see using the Chinese remainder theorem or something that sigma 3 is a multiplicative function. So the e, delta and e4 over 240 are typical the Hecke forms. And you see in weight 12, oh, sorry, in, in weight 4, this is all you have. Anyway, believe me that there's always a basis. So if I took weight 12, it would be delta and some constant times E12, and they would both be Hecke forms, and they span the space. So you always have such a basis. And I just want to say, because it's so important that this is true, and this is the basis of two things that I'm sure you've heard about. One is Jacques Langdon's theory, which gives an interpretation of the whole theory of multiple forms in terms of the representation theory of the idyllic group GL2, and then generalizations to other groups, not just GL2, over the idels. So Jacques Langdon's theory, and the so-called Langdon's program, which I can't go into at all, that would, I could give a nice lecture at the same level, explaining many examples of it, but I don't want to because I wanted to do five different themes. So I'm just saying that this multiplicative property is absolutely crucial. So now let me take uh, a few other examples of different types. So just, again, very briefly, so now I'll write a general theorem so we're now up to example four. This is another class, not Eisenstein series, but they're called theta series. So if lambda is a lattice, but not before we had lattices in C, so they were two-dimensional, but this will be D-dimensional, capital D for some D, which could even be odd, but think of even to simplify things like two-dimensional before. And it has, it's a lattice, so the vectors in it, each lambda in lambda has a length but the length will usually be the square root of an integer, so I prefer to use the quadratic form, which is the length squared, which I want one where these lengths are integers. There are plenty of such lattices, like the famous E8 lattice from the root theory of Lie algebras. Okay? Then it's a theorem, and not a difficult theorem, that the associated series, if you just take all L in the lattice and take Q to this quadratic form, then this is a modular form of weight exactly d over 2, on, maybe on some group, subgroup of SL2z. And if I write this out, then you'll see, well, there's only one term, q to the 0, because there's only one lattice of a vector of length 1. But otherwise, this has a Fourier expansion with arithmetically interesting coefficients, I promised. r lambda of n, I won't write it, it's just the number of vectors whose length, whose square length is n. So it tells you how many vectors there are on, let's say, big ellipse of size n. So that's a general theory, and this has application, I'll just say, to, for instance, well, the theory of quadratic forms, of course, but also to coding theory, and therefore this is actually quite important in some parts of applied mathematics. But there are many other places where this plays a role. And a really easy example where d is odd uh, is if d is 1, and the lattice is simply z, and q of l is simply l squared, then this theta lambda is just what I called theta before. It's the same theta that I used here somewhere, wherever it's gone, there's some, well, 
maybe it's gone, but it was the sum q to the n squared. So that would be a typical example, but these are higher dimensional and higher weight examples. So I just mentioned that because there are whole books uh, by various good mathematicians on coding theory and the theory of lattices and quadratic forms, and they crucially use uh, this theta series property that you can use the theory of multiple forms, and it gives you many results that would be very hard to get without that about you know, Hamming lengths and things like that, Hamming distances. So let me uh, skip on. Uh, how am I doing with time? Oh, it's wonderful. I still can give my remaining examples. So here's an example also in arithmetic, and I like it very much, and I even have one contribution, which I'll mention with De Gros, not the, the same Gross, but not the same theorem that Fernando mentioned. Here I want j of tau is a modular function. Remember, a modular function is weight zero. So I, ever since I introduced modular forms, all of my exams at higher weights. But the easiest way to get something weight zero is to divide two things of the same weight. So remember, we already had delta. I just introduced it at weight 12. E4 at weight 4, so its cube has weight 12. So this is a modular function. In other words, it satisfies j of a tau plus b over c tau plus d is simply equal to j of tau, no factor. Or if you wish, equivalent, since the group we know is generated by these two things, it's invariant under these two transformations. Minus 1 over tau and tau plus 1. So this is some well-known modular function. You can compute it. Well, you can compute it like that, or it has an expansion which plays a role in the famous moonshine story that I might say something about on, I think it's Wednesday. So it has some... Uh, interesting coefficients which start 1744, 1968884. Okay, and now the wonderful uh, classical theory, so 19th and early 20th century theory, is the special values of a modular function or modular form. I'll mean the values j of tau, where tau satisfies a quadratic equation over, over the rationals. And so these special values are always algebraic numbers, in fact, algebraic integers. That's completely amazing. So this function is this very, very surprising property. Let me give you a couple of examples. And sorry? Tau is any tau. It's a, this is a theorem. So tau is anything. There's no special equation. If tau, sorry, special value, I thought I wrote it. Yeah. So here it's written. Tell satisfies any quadratic equation uh, over Q with rational coefficients. So you take any quadratic equation you want, like for instance, tau squared plus 1 equals 0, then tau would be i. But if I put tau squared plus 2 is 0, then tau would be i squared of 2. There's no equation for tau. There are many examples of this theorem. It's a theorem. So any theorem, there should be infinitely many special cases. So take any quadratic equation with rational or integer coefficients which has a, a solution in the upper half plane, and compute j of tau. Then the claim is, and let me do these two. In fact, I'll do two more. So j of i is simply 1728, a number we already saw. But j of i times the square root of 2, which is this number, turns out to be 8,000. So what the theorem says is, without knowing anything, just because i squared of 2 satisfies the quadratic equation, tau squared plus 2 equals 0, automatically, j of i squared of 2 is an, is an integer. And similarly, j of 2i, which satisfies you know, tau squared plus 4 equals 0, is, uh, that one I've forgotten, uh, 287,496. On the other hand, if I continue j of 3i, I didn't say it's always an irrational integer. It's an algebraic integer. And so in this series, the first example, can't read it, so I hope this is 0 and not a 6, but it's one or the other. It's an integer plus an integer times the square root of 3. So these are quite complicated numbers. Nobody said this was going to be easy. But they are integers or algebraic integers, always. OK, that's an absolutely wonderful theorem. But then I want to mention this context because uh, there was an observation that was made and then proved by Gross and myself in the mid-'80s. And for some reason, these numbers have been very famous and tabulated. I think the first big table was from 1928. But nobody had ever noticed the following observation, that all values and all differences
of, of special J values. are highly factored in a completely explicit way. It's actually the only theorem I know in all of mathematics where a number that you construct in some other way, you can give its complete prime decomposition a priori. You can say exactly which primes occur and to what power. So I'll just give a numerical example with the numbers we already have. If I take j of 2i minus j of i, that's a difference of two special values. So it's 287496 minus 1728, and if you factor that, you find 2 to the 3 times 3 to the 6 times 7 squared. So even though the number itself is a quarter of a million, it is no prime factor bigger than 7. And as I say, the complete theorem tells you exactly that the primes occur will be t3 and 7, and will tell you exactly the x ones. It's a complete theorem. So that's kind of amazing. That's not a theorem about non-modular things. So it's not an application. It's a theorem about modular things, namely these special values. But it's a kind of an amazing fact. And it actually is connected with, uh, it goes much, much further. And it's, in fact, a special case of the general theorem that uh, Fernando mentioned that Gross and I proved, which had many consequences in Diophantine analysis. But this one, as it stands, doesn't. OK, so I'm nearly done. That was number five. So after five should come uh, six. So now I want to give applications to Diophantine equations. And all of my last examples would be that. So this is the oldest part of number theory. It goes all the way back to Diophantus in the second or possibly third century AD. Nobody knows exactly when Diophantus lived. So I'll give uh, two straight uh, equations. I'm actually doing injustice myself. I need more examples. 6a is a problem that was posed in an Arab manuscript at the name somewhere of the year 1972, 972, so well over 1,000 years old, and also in a famous book by Fibonacci, the Liber Quadratorum, in 1225. So this is a pretty old uh, problem. It's more than 1,000 years old. And the problem is a number n is called congruent. It's not the usual congruent. if it's the area of a rational right triangle. So Pythagorean triangle with rational sides. So let me give you an example instead of talking a lot. If you take n equals 5, that was the problem that was posed in the Arab manuscript and solved uh, 250 years later explicitly by Fibonacci. If you take 5, then you take the triangle whose sides, the short side is 3 over 2, the long side is 40 over 3, the hypotenuse is 41 over 6. And you check that 41 over 6 squared is 3 halves squared plus 40 over 3 squared. So it is a right triangle, as I claimed. And the error, of course, for right triangles, half the product, 40 over 3 times 3 over 2 is... Uh-oh. Of course, 20 over 3, because it's 40 over 6. So 20 over 3, so half of the product is half of 10. It's 5, so the area is indeed 5. So the question is, if you give me a number, how can you determine if it's congruent? Of course, if you just think of this triangle, but it took 250 years to find this, and if you take n equals 157, I found it, but then the, the numerator and denominator, it exists, but they have 100 digits, almost 100 digits. So even with a computer, you can't just find it by searching. You need a theory. So the question is, how can you find those triangles? And I'll just say briefly that there's a formula I won't write it. I was going to. It takes one minute. If anyone wants to ask, I can put it. This was, there's an explicit formula given by Tunnel that associates to n a certain integer. And if that integer vanishes, then it should be solvable. And if it doesn't vanish, then it's not solvable. So there's a complete answer. And it comes completely from the theory of modular forms. Example 6a, it's a completely different equation. I'm just saying they're both classical Diophantine equations. This is Sylvester's problem. He asked which numbers and then later more, uh, which prime numbers and later which numbers are sums of two cubes. So we already had, remember, the, the equation that I, I counted the solutions with my R2. It was write a number as a sum of two squares. But you can also ask, is n the sum a cubed plus b cubed? Well, this is no longer the nth coefficient of a modular form, but rather amazingly, the theory of modular forms still lets you solve it. And the reason is because this equation, even though it doesn't look like it, is an elliptic curve. And so it fits right in. 
And so I'll mention two theorems. So theorem by Sachet, 1986. If P is a prime, P means prime, 9K plus 2, so 2 mod 9, then 2P is a sum of AQ plus B cubed. And the theorem which I do want to mention because it's joined with my boss here, my immediate boss, Fernando Diego Quevedo, so we proved this uh, in 1995, is if P itself is prime, this was 2P, Sylvester asked about primes, and it turns out the only difficult case is 9K plus 1. The others, at least modular the famous conjecture, you know exactly which primes work, and only depends on P mod 9. But here, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, and our theorem here was that P is a sum of two cubes, if and only if P divides a certain number, BK, where it's the same K, and I'll just give a little table. These are just some numbers, 1, 2, minus 152, 6, 8, 4, 8. They grow very quickly, but there's an elementary recipe. The proof is not elementary. It uses multiple forms. But there's an elementary recursion that gives these BK. So there's a simple sequence of numbers that you can Again, show to a high school student, they're completely computable, and then if you have your 9k plus 1, you just look if p divides the kth element of the sequence, and if it does, it should be a sum of two cubes, and if it doesn't, it isn't. Okay, so those are examples of Diophantine equations. And now I want to come to the final one, which is, of course, the most famous Diophantine equation of all time, which is Fermat's last theorem. So the final application... But I'm going to split it into two parts. Because both are absolutely important theorems of number theory. So my example 7 now, if I haven't miscounted, this is the so-called TW conjecture, which also is called the TW theorem. That's not, as most of you know, because T and W couldn't decide if they proved it or not, but because it's a different T and W, this is Taniyama in a famous remark in some conference proceedings in Japan in 1955. This is Wey in a famous paper in German in 1967, and also Shibori is involved, but in my view not as part of the stating this conjecture. Uh, and this is, of course, Taylor and Wiles. So this is 1994, so much later that it became a theorem. And the theorem is this. Let, if I take two integers, or rational numbers, it doesn't matter. Again, 4a cubed plus 27b squared. Not zero, that's just a detail. And I look at the same equation we had before. So remember, that's how elliptic curves look. So I look at the elliptic curve with rational coefficients or integer coefficients. And the theorem is, the theorem of, that I've already said, Tanyam of A, previously conjecture, in one version, there are two versions, I'll state the other, says, that E, this elliptic curve, always, I mean, many cases were known before, like exactly the ones I needed for those previous theorems were already known, but it always has a modular parameterization. So that's very simple. It's just like parameterizing the circle by cosine theta and sine theta. It means you take two transcendental functions, cosine and sine, which satisfy the equation of the circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1. So what it means is you have x of tau is a modular function on some group, y of tau is another modular function on some other group, and they identically satisfy for every a and b you can find two such functions, which identically as functions of tau satisfy this equation, I mean the equation we're talking about. So you can trace out the elliptic curve just by letting x and y be two modular functions of tau. So this is a fantastic theorem. It was a conjecture for many years. And another equivalent version, but it's not at all obvious, but it had been proved before the theorem was proved. It's equivalent to say that there exists a modular form somewhere of weight 2, which is a hacky form. Remember, that meant it had multiplicative coefficients. And AP is simply p minus the number of solutions of the equation y squared is x cubed plus x plus b, but now it's in integers modulo p. 
So if, if that doesn't make sense to you, but believe me that this is the kind of thing in arithmetic algebraic geometry you utterly want to study. The equivalence of the two versions is not trivial, but it's true. So that's what they proved. And now I come to the last and most spectacular application probably that modern forms will ever have because it was the most, most famous open question of number theory for 100 years or something. Example eight is Fermat's last theorem. So we have the theorem, which is usually ascribed to Taylor and Wiles, but really not because they did the last step. And I'll show you the previous work was to think of a special curve that the Frenchman Eliquach and the German Frey found, and then Serre formulated a very precise statement about it and Rippert proved it. That was about 10 years before Tanyam and Fey, and they proved, they proved that if you had the Tanyama Vey conjecture, this is the Tanyama Vey theorem, so this is Taylor and Wiles, but they showed that the Fermat's last theorem would follow from the Tanyama Vey conjecture, but they hadn't yet proved Fermat because Tanyama Vey wasn't established. But when, Vey, when Wiles did his work, uh, he built on that, so this part was already done. And I'll just take one minute to show you the mechanism, and then I'm finished. So proof, well, except the proof is 300 pages directly and another 2,000 if you put in all the background. So the proof, if I think everyone knows what Fermat's last theorem says, but if what it says is that the following doesn't happen, that you cannot have four integers, a, b, and c non-zero, and n bigger than two, such that a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n. That's what Fermat claimed was true and even claimed it a proof, although I think he dropped the claim since 30 years after he claimed it, he never claimed it again. But anyway, it became very famous because of that. And so the idea is this. Then you look at, and this is the curve that was invented independently, I think. I'm not sure if Fry knew about Eliquash. So Eliquash and Fry invented this curve, the elliptic curve. And remember, an elliptic curve is just an equation. Y squared is a cubic in x. So here's a very simple cubic. I take x times x minus a to the n times x minus c to the n. And that was the curve discovered in a slightly different context by Eliquash. And then Fry realized that it should have the property I'm about to say. Sarah made it very precise, and Ribbett proved it about 10 years later, or a few years later. This elliptic curve has properties that mean that it cannot have a modular parameterization. It's simply, I and mean, that's very, very deep, but there, it uses this multiplicative property of the Zahecki form and all kinds of things, deformations of Galois representations. But if this solution existed, you'd have an elliptic curve which does not have a modular parameterization. But 10 years after Ribbett had proved this theorem, so this is, this is the theorem of, of Ribbett, based on this other, and that's before. He proved that if you had that, that's his theorem, but based on a conjecture of Serre, which implied it, and he proved that conjecture. Once you have this theorem, then you're done. Because if you had such a solution, here would be an explicit elliptic curve with no modular parameterization. But now Taylor and Wiles proved that every elliptic curve does have a modular parameterization. So this elliptic curve doesn't exist. But I wrote it down just using this solution. So the solution doesn't exist, and that's Fermat's last theorem. So that, I hope, gives you an impression of the breadth and scope of the kind of problems of number theory that you can attack with modular forms. And each of the other lectures, as I say, I'll have a different area of applications, like differential equations, not theory. It won't be, there won't be any more number theory, which is good or bad. But that's today's lecture. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Don. It was a wonderful talk. <clears throat> Questions? Yeah. Yes, so, please. number to the 8 power plus uh, whatever, I mean, morally the Fermat theorem, which is false. So can I prove according to the same? If I mean, is, is a general way if of... If you're lucky, yeah, well, Wiles' theorem, this is a general theorem. Every elliptic curve has a modular parameterization. But then you need some very clever friends like Eloquarch and Ribbett and Fry and, and Serre who prove that your particular equation if it had a solution, would give an elliptic curve that contradicts that. And that's very hard. You have, to think of, you have to think of how it works. So the method is general. 
if you can use your special, and there are many examples down the literature, there's a whole industry, so I could give you examples of similar Fermat-like equations, like sometimes it's a simple equation, but it, you can sometimes do things like put 2a and plus b to the n and c to the n and show that that is no solutions. So there are variants, but if you put, uh, you, you know, uh, if I put here 2,193 times a to the n, then nobody knows how to do it because from that one, the corresponding elliptic curve you cannot prove has contradictory. So it's an extremely technical thing to show the proof of this. I did this, I, of course, this is a joke to call the proof. This is the theorem that Rippert proved, and it's a very, very deep proof. And of course, the Taniyama A theorem is even deeper. But to make the connection, you have to construct an elliptic curve, study deeply the Galois inver properties of its so called associated Galois representation, and show that they're not compatible with deep theorems that are now known about those elliptic curves that do have a modular parameterization. And then you're finished. But I can't say at all a priori which equations. So in principle, yes, the method has a wider scope, but it's still very limited. And in, you know, in most cases, of course, it won't work. It's a very, very special tool. Uh, I always thought it was a joke. To me, Fermat's last theorem was famous because you, know, you can tell people on the street. But this was the big thing. But I once asked Wiles, after he proved this, he's a very close friend. I've known him since we were both very young. And I asked him, I said, surely, Wiles, you know, the press, they keep talking Fermat, Fermat, Fermat. Surely you didn't care about Fermat. You wanted to prove the big prize, which is the Tanya Yamave, and thanks to you know, Ken Ribbett, who's a friend of both of ours, that would imply it. He said, no, Don, you're wrong. When I was seven, I heard about Fermat's last theorem. I decided to be a mathematician. I decided to spend my life learning whatever mathematics I needed to prove Fermat's last theorem. That was my goal. I wasn't even interested in multiple forms. I couldn't care less about the Tanya Yamave conjecture. But when Ribbett proved that by proving the Tanya Yamave conjecture, you could get Fermat, then I became a specialist and I worked for eight years and I proved it. So in fact, to me, it's kind of a random application because it's a very special accidental equation, only historically important. This is a very deep and important thing. And it doesn't usually apply to other equations. But luckily, it did apply to that. And luckily, Wiles cared enough about the special case to do the work to prove this. It was you know, 10 years of his life. More questions? I question myself, the, the proof that the G4 and G6 essentially span the whole set of modular forms, is it very difficult or something? It's not can... difficult at all. Uh, let me answer in three lines. It's actually very, very easy. So I told you that if we take dk, the dimension of mk, that there's an explicit form that I told you it's approximately k over 12. But actually, I can write it down exactly if, if t is if k has the form 12r plus 12r, or 12r plus 4, or 12r plus 6, or 12r plus 8, or do we remember it's always even, then the dimension is r plus 1, and if it's 12r plus 2, the dimension is r. So we have an explicit formula. Now you just check that if you take polynomials in g4 and g6, then the number of monomials in g4 and g6 of that weight is exactly this number. So therefore, it's the right number. And it's very easy to show that they're algebraically independent. And so this ring is contained in that, and it has the same dimension as your finger. So it's, it's a three-line proof, but of course you have to do this. There's a little bit of work, but let's say the whole thing, at a very elementary level, for a student, it's in my book, it's, it's one page. So it's not a deep theorem, but it's not an obvious. It is a theorem, but not some deep thing. And it's very special. If I take a subgroup, like gamma zero of 113, then the ring is still finitely generated, but it might have 25 generators and lots of relations. It's just an accident that here, it just happens that it's freely generated. That's not a deep property of modular forms. It's, it's this particular case. But it's always an explicitly computable finitely generated ring with generators and relations. Here it happens to have no relations, so life is easy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another point is, you don't mind, uh, you had the expansions, uh, the Fourier expansion of the modular forms. Yes. And you said that the coefficients have these arithmetic, arithmetic properties. But can well, you well, I didn't quite say that. I mean, of course, they, well, their, their coefficients are numbers, so they have properties. <laughs> I said often the coefficients are numbers that are interesting to you. That's a psychological right. question. I can't guarantee that you will be interested in every multiple form. I will be, because it's my job, <laughs> but you won't be. And I just said very often you get wonderful functions, and I gave many examples. Very good, Like yes. representations as the sum of four squares. Uh -huh. But is it, is it true and is it all easy to see? They are always integers? Well, of course, they aren't always integers, because if I multiply g4 by pi, then they're always integers times pi. 
right? So they aren't obviously, I mean, it's a vector space over C. But what is true, and in this case it's trivial to see, is that there's a basis which does have integer coefficients, and it follows, for instance, from that theorem, because G4 and G6, G6 except for, or E4 and E6 up to a denominator, 240 or something, had integer coefficients. But it's a general theorem of Shimura for any group of this sort. So there is indeed a basis, but then, of course, if you take a stupid linear combination with transcendental coefficients, then you get those coefficients. Okay. But yes, it is a general fact that modular forms can be generated. And I also told you Hecke's theorem, which says, and that's not some random base, it's unique basis. Hecke said that the Hecke forms, remember the ones where a m n is a m times a m, they form a basis, an actual basis. So in m k, there are exactly d k of them. Not more, not fewer. It's not that there is a base of that form. And they always have integer coefficients, but in general, algebraic integers, but still integers. And so there is a very, very strong arithmetic theorem and that, I hope, answers the very question. Good. But of course, not every form because of the you know, scaling by constants. Very good. Thank you very much, Don. So if there are no more questions, we will ask uh, everybody to go outside for the reception and then uh, the students to come down. But before doing that, let's all thank Don again. Ah, thank